Thanks. Um, thanks, Brian. It's been a fascinating morning so far. So what I'm going to attempt to do, um, if it's not too ambitious, is link some of the things that, that, that Wendy was talking about at a, at a societal and global level. Um, and then some of the things that Rashid's been talking about when it comes to sort of CTO and digital leadership within the enterprise. And what does that mean to the individual? Because conversations around IT, where we used to argue about which methodology to adopt for um, project management, have now escalated. And some would say got slightly out of control. Now we're talking about whether or not we are in charge of the future of civilization in the Western world and in all parts of the world, and whether or not we're responsible and accountable for it. And in case, my, my opinion is that we are, but it's not all doom and gloom. So I'm trying to marry the, the large scale, the huge arguments and debates that we've been hearing about with down to our individual, collective individual, if you like, but individual nonetheless, respons responsibility um, before it gets all uh, slightly too over overwhelming. I think COVID has, has given us a, um, an excellent example as to the importance of what it is that we do day to day and how, from an optimistic standpoint, how we might have massive positive impact on the world, but we need to understand the consequences of our actions and be accountable for them. And that's not something that, that's always obvious when it comes down to an individual level, but is actually the most important check and balance we have to making sure that tech doesn't become, in what how some would see, too powerful, too pervasive in our day-to-day -day lives and, and, and start to impact on how we bring up our children, how we interact with our parents, and what that might, might mean for future generations. So I'm starting off big again. So what do I really mean? COVID has stress tested the systems that we have in place in society. And those are systems that are based around the individual. There are systems that have been delivered and brought through by government and also organizations. And we've seen more and more that whilst people who might do key workers tend to be not not always, but there are lots of key workers who aren't the most well paid in organisations. But you might argue that certainly in the pandemic, that their, their work has the, um, the greatest value to make sure that you get goods and services, that you're able to, to work from home. And in fact, we've seen this weird shifting of society where um, people who are on minimum wage have been servicing the needs of those people who aren't, who are able to work from home and live a quite nice life during the pandemic. And what does that mean? And how do we how do we make sure that we're able to balance societies for the benefit of individuals? We've also seen that some organisations have started to behave in a way that, they, that they, they like to think that they do, but actually they're a monopoly and act in a, in a completely different way. What do I mean by that? So we've seen that social media platforms have, and other platforms have been allowed, have, have helped organize, help people reconnect with their communities, look after their neighbours, make sure, check in on people to see that they're getting shopping, make sure that they're, well, they're fit and healthy, offer support and advice, whether that is connecting to the internet for the first time, or actually looking after goods and services that have been delivered while they're unable to collect them, making sure that they can get to appointments at hospitals, GPs, etc., if that's what they had to do. So actually platforms have fulfilled a social function. And that social function was one that we might expect, typically, if we were able to start again and redesign organisations and institutions, that we would expect government to do. You can see an example of this when government said, who would like to volunteer with regards to NHS? There's tens of thousands of people volunteered, but government doesn't have a good function for sharing responsibility of governing. It doesn't have a system. It's used more of command and control. It's a system that's evolved over... Um, 100 years or so, and is very fit for purpose in 1850, but is less fit, fit for purpose in 2020. How do you share responsibility for government? And how do you do that in such a way that you don't just hand over that responsibility to platforms? I don't like the word platform. That doesn't mean I don't value the organisations that deliver it. What I mean by that is, often when we say platform, what we need, mean is monopoly. So when we talk about Facebook as a platform, what we really mean is Facebook as the world's largest advertising monopoly. And if we treat Facebook as the world's largest advertising monopoly, we might choose to interact with it in a different way as a private citizen. We understand that we have value in our private data. And there are laws and policies in place that means that I am unable to go out and sell my organs on the dark web, even though they have a high value, not necessarily my liver, but you understand, you can't sell your organs. And that is to protect the individual and protect society. But you can give away your personal data. 
Should there be a re-understanding, a re-imagining of the value of personal data, right? And see that Facebook has a, a market capitalization, capitalization based on what I give freely. Is that good for the future of democracy and society? And we can see that these IT and ethical conundrums, certainly with Facebook, made real by Cambridge Analytica, become more and more important. Facebook scales very well for the individual, but not necessarily for society. And don't worry, I'm getting back to individual responsibility in this. What I mean by that is very easy for me to use Facebook, and it works brilliantly, in fact, to organise the, um, the rugby team or the football team that you coach or the, um, the meetings that you want to go to or the, or the, uh, the meet-up with friends. It's excellent for that, but it doesn't scale nationally. Because Cambridge Analytica has shown us that actually the way that these platforms operate isn't always in the best interest of society. I mean, the accumulation of, of users doesn't, doesn't scale in that way. Yes, it scales, more users join, but does it scale for the best interest of society? Should that be a function that's undertaken by government? Do we have the digital institutions that would enable us to share and look after those volunteers, but to share the nature, share governing, to look after our communities at a local level? And at the moment, we don't really have that. And in the past, we've actually been able to export our idea of Western parliamentary democracy. How might we build the digital institutions of the future? I would argue in government, it won't be necessarily around the departments that we've, we've previously had. In fact, for all organisations looking at this digital conundrum, what made them successful in the past is unlikely to make them successful in the future. So what does that mean for organisations? As we've just heard from Rashid, I think that the job of the IT teams, digital teams, tech teams, whatever within organizations, and especially in those organizations for organizations that never set out to be in the tech business, but find it thrust upon them. So IBM have got 100 years of um, history and experience in hiring tech talent. But what about Marks and Spencers or the John Lewis partnership or finance organizations or startups? You know, how are they quickly going to evolve to understand the tech part of their enterprise, which is actually going to make or break their success in the future? I think, I think there are three stages that digital teams go through at an organizational enterprise level. One, the IT team or digital team needs to be able to keep the lights on. They need to be able to win the trust of the organization because they're just able to, and that is to do with server uptime and all that kind of stuff. But that is your basic level. You've got to just be able to keep the lights on. You've got to be able to provide the functionality that allows the enterprise to do the job. Next, if you're good at that, I think often you're charged with changing stuff. If you're good at keeping the lights on, how might we change and evolve in the future? And you run projects and all these other good things and you start to win trust again further and, and deeper within the organization until you get to the last thing. I think the job of any digital team these days is to save the organization often from itself. There is sweeping generalizations alert, but there, the leadership of a lot of organizations isn't well versed in what digital means. And digital isn't about a technology. It doesn't mean bikes quickly get loads of people really brilliant at Java or C++. That's not what, it's, that's not what I mean. Digital is just the people, culture, and business models of the internet era. That's what it means. And you've got to have the seeds of your own destruction within your organization. And the seeds of your own destruction are the individuals, the talent that you have at your disposal, because they will unlock, they will have often have the key as to what the future of that organization is going to have to look like. So you've got to have the seeds of your own destruction. The good news is that that sounds bad, but actually it's a lot better than having the seeds of your outside of your organization, that the market is going to change and pivot and just and, and completely disrupt what it is that you're about. So how do you do that? How do you get that talent? How do you have the seeds of your own destruction within your building so you can make it good? Well, I think you're looking for individuals, professionals with three main attributes. And this is what I mean, but trying to bring this down to the individual level. What does professionalism mean when it comes to digital teams who are charged with saving the organization off it from itself? And remember, they're not charged with doing that. That's simply the function that they have to provide. Often leadership are looking at other things and they're talking to the finance director and blah, blah, blah. And let's, let's think about how we're going to do better in the next six months and should we use furlough and blah, blah, blah. But no, how are you going to change the organization is actually going to be how, what is the digital future of that organization? So what three attributes do you need in those individuals that you have and that you will hire or find or acquire? I think those individuals have got to be, those professionals have got to be all about good practice. That's just doing today's stuff well. It is not 
particularly exciting. It is just adopting standards that have been proven to be useful and doing that stuff so you don't have to keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Good news, you can learn from other people's mistakes by adopting standards. So you put in place processes and procedures and lessons learned that have been hard won in the past. So just do that. And that is keeping the lights on. You know, that is just doing really good stuff. It is doing today's stuff well. The next attribute that you as an organization and a specialist and an individual need to do is next practice. Where are your antenna in the market to understand what new technologies are coming down the track? What new tech is material to your organization? How might it affect you as an individual in your career? What do you need to upskill? Do you need to learn new things in a particular area? And how, what is not fashionable? What is material? How do you bring that back into your organization? Educate the team around you so they understand what's going to, what could be the new possibility, the new innovation of these new things? What does this allow for you to do in the future? So good practice. Next practice, doing tomorrow's stuff first. And lastly, is this ethical piece. And for me, often with the enterprise, this ethical is, is everything that you, you bring you, yourself to work, everything that you are and everything that's built you, you've got to bring that and make, you know, we know that more diverse teams build better outcomes. It's, 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 it's really important, but we bring all of ourselves to work so that we can understand what is the nature of our building blocks and how that might relate to the organization. In the past, we've seen, you know, ethics is actually a potential for competitive advantage. And we've seen companies get suddenly change and switch. You know, the, the accumulation of personal data, as I spoke to at the beginning, was seen as a good thing and a positive thing, but actually, it quickly became negative. And actually the accumulation of, of personal data was not a smart move for organizations. It just led to massive corporate risk. So how might we, by bringing all of ourselves to work, understand what, what the things that we do day to day, how might that influence our organization and our customers and the lives of and people in, within society that operate around it? I think one of the most important lessons in that is the is sort of laws of unintended consequences. When we come to scale, and we talked about Cambridge Analytica, I mean, there's other, loads and loads of examples. What we set out to do doesn't always happen because of the scale and reach that digital has. Sometimes you've got to ask yourself, what if everyone adopted this? What might be the outcomes? We're getting to that sort of level where these are really critical questions. The example I often use is the work we did with the Children's Commissioner at BCS um, several years ago now. But one of the data sets came out, it's a very London-centric piece of data, but 40% of 11-year-olds sexed. Now, that can't be good for the future of interpersonal relationship. But also good news is that Snapchat, which is the platform that was mostly used in, 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 as an example in that space, Snapchat, their, their goal, their mission was about the mass democratization of encrypted messaging. It wasn't about let's get more prepubescent teenagers to share naked photos of each other, thankfully. No, their mission was hugely positive. All they had to do was make sure they had that ethical piece. They had to, what if everyone adopted our platform? What might that mean in the future? You know, Netflix do an amazing job providing to me as a customer um, a brilliant viewing experience. But if you mash up that, that algorithm that says, just show me things that I want to see, and you put that in my social media feeds so that it's very difficult for me to interact with people unless they have a very, very similar mindset and view to me. But what does that mean when it scales nationally? How do you, when you mash that, that up with facial recognition, you're actually eroding the relationship between citizen and state. I'm no longer a public citizen. I've become an as yet unconvicted criminal. So if you, if you think about that, that context with Jane, with, with Dame Wendy Hall previously, then you're starting to think, well, what, might be, what by, might be the inference? What might be the unintended consequence of my action? And that comes right down to that individual. Good practice. Um, next practice, and then the ethical conundrum, bringing your full and whole self to work. But it's not all negative. In fact, I am, um, I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist about the future and the impact of digital to do amazing things for society. And there's plenty of and, and many examples, but I would say the reason why you want those professionals who have those three attributes is if uh, digital to make good on its hopeful promise that tech can save the world, that it can help with the um, with people using that, it can get us out of 
a COVID get us out of a global pandemic, is that hope needs to be aligned to critical thinking. And that's what good practice, next practice, and ethical understanding brings. That's our job. So our job as an individual is to provide that layer of critical thinking. If we're gonna make good on our hopeful promise, we need critical thinking. Because hope without critical thinking is just naivety. And critical thinking without hope is just cynicism. And it's our job, yes, to deliver on that hopeful promise, but to do it in such a way that we protect against un unintended consequences. And we understand that the organizations, enterprises, and institutions that we build are fit for a digital future that allows everybody, regardless of background, but it allows everybody to thrive in the digital environment. And that digital environment enhances everyone's life experience. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. We, we really appreciated that. Uh, we appreciate the update on the health of your liver as well. So thank you so much for filling us in there. Um, just to, we just got a couple of minutes. So I just want to put one, one question to you. It, it came out in some of the previous strands. We never really explored it that much. Uh, in, in particularly the sustainable issues area of things, how can we um, empower the, be, the, the professional to just feed back more to the business? So 40% in our survey said they didn't feel necessarily comfortable doing that. Is that for us as BCS to give those professionals the strength to be able to do that? Yeah, I think um, BCS needs to continue to, to build on some of the successes. I mean, education is, is, is an obvious example, but it's a societal-wide problem. It's not just one of the, of the, of the individual professional. But what can that, can that individual do? But I think it's is to understand that you have a critical function. So I, I didn't mean it glibly when you have saved the organization often from itself. And organizations have a societal function outside of sort of profit and loss and all the rest of it. But actually, what does gainful employment look like in, in 20 years' time? So we have to be bolder. We have to be bold. We were always saying previously, wouldn't it be great if people understood the ubiquitous nature of IT? Mm. Well, thanks to all sorts of different things that have happened in politics and policy, but also in pandemics and health and social care, people do get that. Now is the opportunity to really make, make good on that and put in that layer of critical thinking and ask people the critical questions when uh, and not just blindly follow. So it is our job, I think, to be leaders and we need individuals to step up and be leaders of organisations. I think the days of the, the quickest route to being CEO or, or, or leader used to be in finance. And now I believe it's through technology and understanding of technology and how it impacts. And it's no um, surprise that a lot of forward thinking chief executives are actually take their um, mentoring from people coming through apprenticeship schemes, understanding actually how their organisations, product services might be used in the context of future generations and how they remain relevant to that market. Speak up. Okay. Now, Rashid was, was quite optimistic about the, the CTO role and how that's uh, sort of uh, re-emerging, as it were. You have a lot of interaction uh, with, with, with businesses. Are you optimistic about what you see amongst IT professionals now, especially perhaps bearing in mind the last 18 months or so? I am, but I, I, I also think that this, this sort of self-identification as IT professional is, is actually going to decline. And ironically, it's going to decline at the same time that the amount of digital skills that are adopted, learned and acquired in organisations is grow, going to grow exponentially. I don't think there'll be many jobs le left that can't be plotted to some extent, greater or lesser extent, on the Sophia framework. There will be daily work tasks, activities, project long and, and, and whole career life cycle aspects, which will be digital even 100% completely or, or in greater part made up of digital content and digital skill sets. But I think people who self-identify as IT professionals is probably going to shrink. I might be wrong, but I think people say, yes, I do marketing or finance or projects or whatever, but actually the, the, the increasingly the proportion of that, that task will be, that skill set required will be digital. So in fact then, um, without wishing to trump it out ourselves over much, because obviously I'm a BCS person, our role as convener becomes more important because of that, not less important just because no, no, people are not necessarily calling themselves IT professional. Yes, absolutely. So they will want to acquire different skills, different digital skills, different digital levels of understanding at various stages throughout their career and keep that topped up and up to date. The guy did this sort of good practice and next practice, um, but it's going to be, you know, the digital world is, is, is growing continuously, not just in Moore's law, but exponentially. And so 
how do you stay relevant and up to date? It's incredibly hard because you get one, as soon as you allow yourself to start taking some of this input, you get bombarded, but it's, mm. it's important therefore as well to be not just a convener, but to understand as a communicator what's relevant, what's fashionable, what's material to me and my organization. 